I think it's useful perhaps to start by recalling why reducing inequalities is so important um, as a tool to reconcile the two challenges we must address together, environmental sustainability and social justice, the two pillars, if you wish, of the donut economics vision that is uh, guiding the reflections throughout today's discussions and that is inspiring the regions of, of Brussels capital uh, in its uh, plan for a sustainable and just transition. Reducing inequalities is absolutely vital for three reasons. First, because in a more equal society, we need much less economic growth in order to address poverty because growth will be more equally shared. And uh, therefore, we will be able to mitigate the tension that otherwise exists between mitigating um, uh, inequality, uh, poverty, reducing e poverty, and um, reducing our ecological footprint. It is essential to recall that economic growth cannot be absolutely decoupled from the use of resources and from the production of waste and pollution. And so we need um, to, uh, to think about a development model that does not rely entirely on, on growth and that instead puts the fight against inequalities at its heart. Number two, in a more equal society, um, Conspicuous consumption driven by status competition is much less prevalent. Um, much of our consumption patterns are dictated by um, uh, the need to impress the neighbors, to compete on the social ladder, and that is much less a pressure in more equal societies. Thirdly and finally, and this is often um, overlooked in discussions about inequality, in highly unequal societies, the um, resources are very often used in order to satisfy the desires of the richest parts of the population that have a purchasing power, allowing them to command control over these resources. Instead, in more equal societies, the resources will be used to satisfy the needs of average people or even um, low income households, rather than the desires, the frivolous desires in some cases, of the ultra rich. And so a society uses its scarce resources more efficiently in more equal societies um, uh, rather than uh, simply catering to the, to the demand uh, emanating from the richest groups of the population. So for these three reasons, I think the fight against inequalities is absolutely vital to reconcile environmental sustainability and social justice. However, in the EU, governments face significant constraints that makes, makes it very difficult for them to actually pursue uh, an equality-driven agenda. And I look forward, of course, to our discussions on this, but my, my assessment based on the visit I, I did, the mission I did to the EU earlier this year, is that there are three, three major constraints um, imposed on EU member states trying to reduce inequalities. The first constraint is very simply, tax competition, fiscal dumping. Um, we are in a market, the internal market, in which uh, states compete to attract investment, and they do so inter alia by lowering um, the uh, taxes on, on corporate uh, 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 profits. Um, since 1997, there is, of course, as we all know, a code of conduct on business taxation, and there's a working group a group of high-level representatives of member states trying to address the most egregious forms of abuse. But despite these safeguards, over the past 20 years, the average statutory um, um, corporate income tax has been reduced by 11%. And some small countries in the EU are still seeking to attract companies simply by providing um, fiscal advantages by lowering the taxes that their profits are subjected to. And this is at the expense of small and middle-sized enterprises who cannot as easily uh, resort to tax avoidance and tax optimization strategies as the large multinational groups. And it is, of course, at the expense of households, households who increasingly shoulder um, the burden of um, the tax uh, service 
because uh, the tax burden has been shifting from, from corporations and the most mobile factors of production to, to households. So I think this, this tax competition is one major impediment to uh, adopting progressive taxation schemes and particularly uh, to ensuring that corporations contribute uh, to financing public services and social policies. In my view, it's a very significant defeat for Europe that it is through the OECD that finally measures are now being taken to ensure a minimum corporate income tax is um, imposed across um, um, uh, the countries participating in the BEPS initiative of the OECD. The second constraint is um, social dumping. Some EU member states still believe that they can improve their external cost competitiveness by reducing wages and by reducing the social contributions that employer pay in contributory social uh, protection schemes. And that seems to me to be a very serious problem, particularly in a context in which the, the gaps between different EU member states with respect to average uh, wages remains extraordinarily high. Um, this weakens um, unions and their ability to bargain for better working conditions and, and better wages. And um, it, um, um, it, 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 it leads to a situation in which some, some member states are fearful of increasing the wages of workers because they will be less competitive in the internal market. And that seems to me to be a, a very serious problem that um, the proposal for a framework directive on adequate minimum income, uh, sorry, adequate minimum wage in the EU seeks to address. This was a proposal made in October 2020 by the European Commission. I very much hope that the member states shall um, give this uh, proposal the, um, the response that it deserves. Thirdly and finally, we know of course that since the economic and monetary union was launched uh, with the Treaty of Maastricht, states in the EU are subjected to significant budgetary disciplines under the Stability and Growth Pact of 1997, under the Treaty on Stability, Convergence and uh, Governance, uh, Cooperation and Governance of 2012, they are forced to keep their public deficits under control and, and reduce their public debt. Now, of course, um, these constraints have been set aside in order to allow the EU member states to face the impacts of the, of the pandemic. Um, but there is now a big debate as to what shall be the future of the Stability and Growth Pact and the budgetary disciplines enforced through the European semester. Um, it is important to realize that over the past 20, 25 years, many member states have actually been forced to reduce social investment in early childhood education and care, in healthcare, in lifelong training, in education, all this in the name of fiscal sustainability of maintaining their deficits at an acceptable um, level. This is counterproductive even from the strict economic point of view because we know that um, um, investing in education, in early childhood, in, uh, in healthcare, is the best way to prepare the future and to maintain a productive, healthy, and well-qualified workforce, of course. Um, so these are three major constraints that result in a situation in which even states which have uh, the best intentions in the world may find it very difficult to have a, a progressive uh, agenda. So we need to overcome these constraints, but we need, of course, to also think about reducing poverty and inequalities uh, by moving beyond post-market approaches. Let me explain um, what I mean by this. In general, the fight against poverty, the fight against inequalities is based on the idea that we should grow the economy and then adopt progressive taxation schemes and public services and social policies in a tax and transfer um, scheme that is based on the idea that the economy uh, growing, we can then redistribute the incremental wealth that is created. Now that problem, or, or that's, that 
approach rather creates a problem, which is that we rely on economic growth in order to address inequalities and in order to reduce um, poverty. Yet in the name of growth, we've been deregulating labor markets, we've been liberalizing trade, sometimes with very adverse consequences on some groups of the population. We've been creating a so-called business-friendly environment, which in fact means in particular reducing the regulatory burdens and the, the tax burdens on corporations. In other terms, we've been creating an economy that excludes rather than includes in the name of stimulating economic growth. And so we need to think beyond growth as a solution to reduce poverty and inequalities. And that means um, adopting pre-market approaches, changing the economy so that it becomes less violent, more inclusive. Let me give just four examples to close. Promoting the social and solidarity economy so that gradually what is the exception becomes the rule and so that the many cooperatives and non-profit um, uh, sector organizations in the EU are given much more opportunities to thrive. Secondly, supporting the commons, these citizens-led initiatives that promote alternatives to providing services by either the market or the state, and that try to manage by themselves um, uh, the provision of energy, of uh, uh, food by CSA schemes, um, um, of um, um, education and so on. We have many such initiatives that are neither based on the profit motive of market actors nor distributed centrally by the state that deserve to be much more significantly supported. Thirdly, we need governments to do much more to address discrimination on grounds of social economic condition. I work every day with people in poverty who face discrimination from um, uh, school to, 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 to university and to, and to employment, and they, um, they face many obstacles, as visible minorities do, in their ability to achieve equal opportunities. And we should strengthen the fight against discrimination on grounds of poverty, because otherwise poverty will continue to be perpetuated from one generation to the next. Fourth and finally, I believe corporations could do much more in order to contribute to this fight against poverty and inequalities. For example, by ensuring that they protect or guarantee a living wage throughout global supply chains, or that they promote economic democracy, ensuring that the strategic decisions made by companies will be made um, together with social part, with the unions and with um, other stakeholders working with the firm. And I believe these are various measures, and of course the list could be longer, of what is an inclusive economy uh, that show that we could do much more to create a non-violent economy, an inclusive economy, one that does not have to grow in order to address all the societal problems that we face. Many thanks, and I look forward, of course, to our discussion.